Okay, so I wanted to just do a little more with the sum and difference rules. We've already we've already done a bunch of sort of examples. Find the sine of this, the cosine of this, the tangent of this. Let's try. Let's try verifying an identity or two. So section 9.1 material. Let's show that the sign of alpha plus beta minus the sine of alpha minus beta is twice the cosine of alpha times the sine of beta. So when you're verifying identities, the conventional wisdom is that you start with the more complicated looking side or the side where you know you have the most stuff that you can do. The right hand side, it's really hard to know what to do with the cosine of alpha times the sine of beta. It doesn't really lend itself to any kind of rewriting. Whereas we now know there is clearly a bunch of stuff we could do on the left-hand side. The sine of alpha plus beta we can rewrite using the sum identity and the sine of alpha minus beta, we can rewrite using the difference identity. So let's try rewriting both of those and see if we end up with what we want to end up with. So this is the sine of alpha, the cosine of beta, plus the cosine of alpha times the sine of beta minus, so this is the sine of alpha, the cosine of beta, minus the cosine of alpha times the sine of beta. And hopefully this is about where we need to be. Let's see what happens. <coughs> so stuff's going to cancel, at least in part. We've got this sine of alpha times the cosine of beta showing up twice, but in the first place it's positive, in the second place it's negative. So good, that's going to cancel. And the reason I say good is that, you know, we look at what we're aiming for. We don't want sines of alpha and we don't want cosines of beta. So it's good that they're going away. We've got a cosine of alpha and a sine of beta. And again, looking at what we want, that's exactly what we want. We want to have two of them as a matter of fact. And now this subtraction is going to distribute
and everything works out just the way it should. Our sine, alpha, cosine, betas go away. And we wind up with two cosine, alpha, sine, betas, precisely the way we want, precisely what we wanted to have. So we started on the left and we messed around and we ended up with the term on the right, which is how verifying identities, ideal these should go. Sometimes, Yeah, I mean, sometimes you have students try to sort of mess around with the left term and the right term and kind of meet at the middle. I normally think that's complicating things unnecessarily. Let's do another example. I would call this example relatively straightforward, which doesn't mean easy, but it does mean that um, that there's really only one thing, it probably makes sense to try. I think the, um, what will cause, you know, verifying identity problems to sometimes be difficult is if you go off in a dead end. Like you see a sine squared and you re remember the Pythagorean identity, so you rewrite it as a cosine squared, but actually you needed that sine squared to turn into a tangent. Stuff like that can really make life a headache. But here, <clears throat> it's extremely likely that we want to use the difference identity here. And the reason I say it's extremely likely, I mean, partly it's because we're in this section of the textbook, so I have some meta-knowledge, but also it's because having a trig function, I was going to write trig, it turned into tan out of habit. Having a trig function with a sum or difference, I mean, these identities we have allow us to rewrite that as the sum or difference of trig functions. And that's precisely what we're trying to do here. We've got this difference inside of the trig function. On the right, we have our difference outside the trig function. So going from inside to outside is precisely what this identity does. So it seems very hopeful to just start on the left and hit the top with the difference formula. The sine alpha, cosine beta, minus cosine alpha, sine beta, all divided by the cosine of alpha times the cosine of beta. And now I'm trying to think about where to go next. Um, well, our goal is to have 
something minus something else. And in particular, we want to have a fraction. The tangent is a fraction minus another fraction. So to, a, to an extent, you just sort of mess around until you get where you want to be. But there is a method to this. If we want to turn the single fraction we have down here into two fractions, we are allowed to do that. Fractions break up in this way. As long as the subtraction or addition is in the top. We wouldn't be able to do this if the subtraction was down in the denominator, but it isn't. So good news. And now it's probably, if you give it a little thought, we can probably see what we want to do next, which is what? I want to get sine over cosine so we can just cancel. So cosine B, cosine B. Yeah, exactly correct. Those cancel and over there, the uh, cosine of alphas cancel, and we get the tan of alpha minus the tan of beta, exactly what we wanted. And now, this is not going to take us to 150, but I guess that's not the end of the world. Let's, um, let's do one kind of problem that's more complicated and is not quite like anything we've done before. It's not verifying. It's not just, you know, simplifying. Or rather, I mean, I guess it's verifying an identity of a sort. But let's look at the Cartesian plane. And let's look at two straight lines. Going from the fourth axis into the first, the fourth quadrant, into the first quadrant. So these lines have slopes. And I realize that I did not label them in my notes but I think I want to call the slope of that line M1 and the slope of the other line M2. <laughs> and suppose you're interested in this angle. Well, that angle is related to the slopes of the line in a somewhat convoluted way, the tangent of theta is the one slope minus the other slope divided by one plus the products of the slopes. And this is what we'll try to show. 
Again, so essentially we're verifying a trig identity, but it's it's framed a little differently. Usually, I mean, a trig identity, you're going to have trig functions on the left and trig functions on the right. Here, we seemingly have trig functions on the left, but no trig functions on the right. Well, let's write in some new angles, theta one and theta two. And as far as how we know how to do this, I mean, for me, this is kind of my high school geometry instincts coming alive. We have a, some triangles. We have a shape on the board. We want to make statements about angles. So my first instinct is always kind of, well, let's label everything and see if we get anything out of it. And this is sort of, this works especially well here, because I mean, if we want to mess around with trade functions on the left, we probably want trade functions on the right. I mean, all of the stuff we've done before is that. So it would be really helpful if we could think of M2 and M1 as being trig functions. And we can do that. Um, No problem. The tangent of theta one equals M one. This maybe requires some thought. Let me, let me try to draw that again with our horizontal line slightly more horizontal. So M1 is the slope of that line. And I'm claiming that the slope is the tangent of that angle. And to see that, so ignore the second line for a moment and create a right triangle. The slope of this line is the rise over the run. And here the rise is also the side opposite the angle. And the run is the side adjacent to the angle. So the rise over the run is the opposite over the adjacent, which is the tangent. And the tangent of theta two equals m two. The slope of the other line, exact same argument. So, this 
the tangent of theta, our next problem is that we don't have any identity that would let us rewrite the tangent of theta. The only, I mean, this isn't quite true. There are the co-function identities and stuff, but really the only sort of useful seeming identity that we have involving the tangent is the sum or the difference formula. And what's more, the sum and the difference formulas are really similar to what we want. Like the tangent of alpha plus beta, or maybe I should say the tangent of alpha minus beta, it's the tangent of alpha minus the tangent of beta over one plus the tangent of alpha plus the tangent of beta. And if we compare this to this, well, in fact, they're the same. Now that we've made the observation that this M sub two is a tangent and this M sub one is a tangent, we've got the tangent minus the tangent divided by one plus the product of the tangents. That's exactly what we get from the sum and the difference formula. So the question then becomes, well, we don't have a sum or a difference. We have theta. Can we rewrite theta as a sum or a difference. Again, our high school geometry says that, uh, I forget the technical phrase, but if you create two angles by making lines intersect, the angles you create are equal to each other. So this angle up here is theta, but we also have theta down there. And this is theta sub two. And this is pi minus theta sub two. When we see that, and I keep talking about high school geometry, I guess I don't know with the Nebraska curriculum, but I assume you've maybe seen this before. Anyway, all we're doing here is using the fact that theta two together with this angle make pi radians because a straight line is pi radian. So here's theta o two, here's pi minus theta two. And now we can say that theta plus theta one plus pi minus theta two equals pi. And this is because pi is 180 degrees and it's one of those famous things that 
we presumably learn at some point or another that there are 180 degrees in a triangle. So there are pi radians in a triangle. So theta plus theta one plus pi minus theta two equals pi. Our pi's cancel out. And we wind up with theta being one of these angles minus the other angle, which is absolutely perfect because that's exactly what we have here. I mean, the tangent of theta two minus theta one equals the tangent of theta two minus the tangent of theta one over one plus the tangent of theta two times the tangent of theta one. And this is supposed to be m2 minus m1 over 1 plus m2 times m1. And the tangent of theta 2 is m2. The tangent of theta 1 is m1. This is precisely what we wanted. So kind of convoluted, um, and really maybe the most useful observation out of this has nothing to do with the sum and the difference formula. Maybe the most useful observation out of this is that the slopes of lines are tangent. And we'll see that again later in the course when we start talking about polar coordinates.